Hello class! Today we're going to talk about Newton's laws of motion. No reason to put it off. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so let's first take a look at Newton's first law. I think everybody has a slightly different way that they like to say the first law. I have no idea how Newton actually said it, although I'm sure I could look it up. I would imagine it was very complicated. The way I like to say it is a body in motion will stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. There's another part to it, which is pretty much just take the at motion and make it say at rest. So a body at rest will stay at rest unless acted upon by an outside force. I think I'm just going to write it like this to try to cover both bases without having too much text on the screen. So a body in motion, and then I'll just say or in parentheses at rest will stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. Newton's second law can really be described best with this equation where it says F net is equal to M times A where that is saying the net force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. The third law says for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. So these are the three laws of motion. Let's go ahead and take a slightly closer look at each of these. Sometimes people call Newton's first law the law of inertia. Inertia being something that is somewhat similar to mass and that if I have a lot of mass, I have a lot of inertia, but it's really the resistance to wanting to change motion. So if I'm sitting still and I have a lot of mass, I have a lot of inertia that says I do not want to start moving. If there is a speeding train coming towards you that is very massive, you should get out of the way because it's inertia means it doesn't want to stop moving. I could take Newton's first law and I could write it in a slightly different way. So maybe this is Newton's less eloquent nephew's first law. It says that things will keep moving however they were moving until something messes with them. You've seen this in practice a million times. Let me take a little toy caterpillar that my kids have and say I could do a little experiment. I'll put it on a table and let's watch it. It's still there. If nothing comes by to touch the thing or to move it or put an outside force on it, nothing is going to happen to it. It's at rest and it wants to stay at rest. Looking at something that's at motion is a little bit more complicated. I'm going to blow your mind here with some high-tech graphics. And here we go. We've got a hockey puck on frictionless ice. It's just moving right along. It is in motion, and as long as that ice is truly frictionless, it will stay in motion because there are no outside forces that are acting on it that are going to cause it to change direction, to change speed. It's just going to continue doing whatever it was doing. The problem with this one, conceptually, is that when was the last time you saw frictionless ice? This one is significantly harder for us to test. The best we can usually do is see ice that's pretty slippery. You can see that hockey puck moving fairly well on frictionless ice. You can think of air hockey tables or air tracks. Those are also pretty good at removing friction. But again, this one is hard for us to test. Newton's second lie said looked like this equation. F net is equal to mass times acceleration. What I really want to do here is I want to take a look at this word net. It's important that you understand what's being talked about. If I pull one of those, hey, I have an idea, let's go to the dictionary and see what net means. Then I can find something that looks like this with all these different definitions of net. Now, in physics, what we're talking about is probably best represented by this one that's way down there that says the ultimate or final, the net result. So we are talking about net forces, which are not the same thing as talking about the individual component forces. Let me give you an example. I have a lemonade stand. If I charge 10 cents for my tasty lemonade, yet it costs me 10 cents for all the supplies to make the lemonade, I had a net profit of zero. The component to this equation is the price or the supplies, but the net profit or the net money associated with this example remains zero. All right, let's take a look at what this means for our forces. If I have a box sitting, I can push on it with 10 newtons of force. Remember, a newton is the unit we use to describe the quantity of force. 
the SI system, the metric system. I can push on it from the other side as well, also with 10 newtons of force if I want. If I want to describe what the net force is, I have to add up all the individual forces. Because those forces are vectors and they're pointing in opposite directions, one of them is going to get tagged with a plus 10, the other one gets tagged with a minus 10. So my net force ends up being zero. If my net force is zero, so the entire left-hand side of my equation is zero, that means the right-hand side must be zero also. Well, the mass is just the mass of the box, whatever that is. That means by requirement, if the net force on an object is zero, that means that that object cannot accelerate. In this example, I'm pushing from the left with 25 newtons of force and only pushing from the right with 10 newtons of force. So if I want to say what is the net force, in this case I have positive 25 minus 10 gets me a positive 15 newtons of force, or 15 newtons to the right. Remember, it is a vector. Go back to the equation, plug in a F net of 15 newtons, and then I'm going to have some non-zero mass associated with this box. So that means that I will have some sort of acceleration associated with it. There are lots of different ways to end up with similar diagrams that have forces going in one way or the other. Let's take this one for example, pushing from the left with 10 newtons of force. Well, perhaps there's friction acting on the box, also with 10 newtons of force in the opposing direction. That could be giving me the same result of a net force equal to zero, which just says that this box is not accelerating. Don't get too caught up on the idea for on what side of the box is the arrow. What's important is the direction of the arrow. So this is a situation where I'm showing that perhaps the box is being pulled, showing the force vector on the right, pulling with 10 newtons. I'm showing friction opposing the motion with 10 newtons to the left. Same thing, net force zero, no acceleration. I could also have lots of vectors. In this situation, I have three different vectors, all of 10 newtons. They don't all have to be the same, but I'm showing that they're all pulling to the left. I've got one vector that's pulling to the right of 25. F net is the sum of all forces, so I have positive 25 minus 10 minus 10 minus 10 to get a net force of minus 5 newtons. So remember the key to this equation though is that F net on the left hand side of the equation is the sum of all forces. I like to show that as F net is equal to F1 plus F2 plus F3 and so on. However many forces there are, they all need to be included. The only exceptions to this are internal forces where all of the force is actually happening internal to the system. That can be a little bit tricky to identify sometimes, but I'm going to show a couple examples of that in just a moment. So how might we use this equation? F net is equal to mass times acceleration. Let's take an example where we're given an F net. I'll go ahead and start us with the information that F net is equal to 10 newtons. Then I'll say if m is equal to, I'll give another piece of information. Then we'll solve for what the acceleration would be. If m is equal to 10 kilograms, then we would find that the acceleration is equal to one meter per second squared. That would be something that would approximate perhaps a car accelerating after a stoplight. If m is equal to 5,000 kilograms, that might be something like an elephant, then the acceleration would only be 0 0.0002 meters per second squared. That's something that you would have to look at that for several seconds to even be sure that it's actually going to start moving. We're saying as long as it's starting from rest. If it were starting from rest, it would move about one foot in about a minute or so to give you a feel for what that acceleration would be. If my object were 0 0.02 kilograms, that might be the mass of, say, a soup spoon. Then I'm going to get at an acceleration that would be 500 meters per second squared. That is the acceleration that a bullet might experience inside the barrel of a rifle. Now let's take a look at Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. I like to doctor this up a little bit, add a few words. We're going to add some information about vectors. I like to talk about this in terms of force. I'm going to reword it to look a little bit like this. For every action force,
there is an equal magnitude and opposite direction reaction force. Let's look at an example to help identify Newton's third law. In this example, I'm going to push on a wall with about 10 newtons of force. 10 newtons is not a large amount of force. That's about the amount that it would take to hold up a full one liter water bottle. If I push on the wall with 10 newtons of force and I'm not moving anywhere, I'm not accelerating, F net must be equal to zero. We can look to Newton's other laws to find that out. If that's true, there must be another force countering my force of 10 newtons. Sometimes I call this the pushback force. This is the force where the wall says, yeah, even though you're pushing on me, I'm not really interested in toppling over. It's going to push back. It's called the normal force. This is a situation where we need to be careful about the word normal. What normal means for us is this little guy right here. So if we zoom in, what we're saying is that this definition of normal means perpendicular to the surface. And that's all we're saying by this normal force. So that pushback force from the wall is always perpendicular to the surface. And it is a reactionary force. That's what we call it. The reason why it's a reactionary force is because I could increase my force to 20 newtons on the wall. That just means the wall is going to continue to push back with 20 newtons. I could push, as I'm showing here, with any strange number. How about 127.3 newtons? That just means that the wall is going to push back with 127.3 newtons. It has to be the same number that I am actually applying to the wall. It's just the pushback force. The only exception is that if I were strong enough to push so hard to topple the wall over, my applied force that I'm putting on the wall would become such a large number that the wall could no longer push back with sufficient force. Then there would be a net force and the wall would be required to briefly accelerate. Let's take a look at a different example where I have two astronauts out in space and they get into a little bit of a tiff. One or both of the astronauts push each other. This is actually a pretty complicated situation when the two astronauts are making contact with each other and when they are pushing on each other, they will have equal and opposite forces felt. From there, let's just look at one of the astronauts. Let's say the one on the left. That astronaut feels a force pressing him or her to the left, which will create a net force, which in turn requires that the astronaut accelerate outward. Because of Newton's third law, there is an equal and an opposite force that will also cause the astronaut to accelerate out to the right. But once the two astronauts are no longer making contact with each other, they have no ability to push on each other. That means that for, say, the left astronaut, F net goes back to zero. So then they have to move at a constant velocity. I get asked the question, which one of the astronauts was it that actually pushed the other? Or did they both push on each other? And the answer, believe it or not, is that it doesn't really matter. It's impossible for one astronaut to push on the other without having that Newton's third law, that equal and opposite reactionary force. Let's just move to some of our conclusions here. We have Newton's three laws of motion. Remember the first law, sometimes called the law of inertia, is the one that says a body in motion will stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. Same is true for a body that's at rest, it will stay at rest. Newton's second law is F net is equal to mass times acceleration. Remember that the net means sum all the forces up, all of the individual forces that are acting on your system. The external forces, those need to be added to complete F net. If I have an F net equal to zero, then my acceleration must also be equal to zero. Remember, though, that that could mean that you're moving at a constant velocity, or it could mean that you are actually sitting stationary. Newton's third law says that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And remember that I like to put in those extra words and say that for every action force, there's an equal magnitude and opposite direction reactional force. If you need to go back and look at some of this, by all means, go ahead. But for now, if you think you got things figured out, let your computer know.